Thanks very much, Chris. Um, you were a really great witness for our inquiry earlier on this year. Um, I thought I might just kick off by explaining what the House of Lords Science and Technology Select Committee is and does. Um, some of you are from other countries, and I'm not sure of the exact parliamentary system you have there, but in this country, the upper chamber, the House of Lords, as the lower chamber, the House of Parliament, has a system of select committees covering different areas, economy, agriculture, and so on, that, uh, whose job it is to select a topic for investigation and hold the government to account, uh, make recommendations to the government how they could, through their actions, improve the performance or the outcomes in a particular uh, subject area. The Science and Technology Select Committee that I have the privilege of chairing um, chose uh, about a year ago to conduct an inquiry into the topic of regenerative medicine. Um, why did we choose that? Because we thought after deliberation about a lot of possible topics that this was um, an area of great importance for public health, for um, commercialization and uh, uh, industrial development and of scientific um, inquiry. So it seemed to bring together all these different strands, and so we decided to launch an inquiry. Um, I'll explain uh, shortly how the inquiries are conducted, uh, but the, the outcome of an inquiry is to make recommendations to the government about actions that they should take and try to follow that up, and again, I'll come back to that uh, later on. So let me, without further ado, see if I can get the next slide up. So the purpose of the inquiry was to look at uh, the current UK strengths in the areas of regenerative medicine, and we were particularly interested in translation from the laboratory ben bench into the clinic over the next five to ten years. We really wanted to focus on what was likely to happen soon uh, whilst keeping a watching eye on what was going to happen in the much longer term. And we particularly wanted to focus on the barriers that might exist in translating uh, scientific research results into clinical practice and uh, the commercialization of products. We didn't include ethical considerations because we decided that other inquiries had looked at that relatively recently. Uh, just to be clear about the definition, I suspect this is from, from Chris. Uh, this is the, the, method, the uh, definition we used of regenerative medicine, which I don't need to go through with you. And uh, that obviously cast the net fairly widely, including uh, cell therapies, tissue engineering, etc. So we looked at it in, in the broad sense. Um, just to uh, summarize how we uh, collect the information, the reports that we produce can only be based on evidence that we've received. We can't make it up. Uh, it has to be uh, evidence that's been presented to us on the public record. So everything is published on, on the internet and the final report in hard copy. So we started off our inquiry with a seminar in which experts, including Chris, gave us their view of the state of the art of the field and the issues of uh, translation and commercialization. Then we sent out a call for written evidence, anybody who wanted to, and perhaps some of you submitted written evidence. We had 89 different submissions, and that's all sifted by the uh, committee clerk, um, Chris Atkinson, who's sitting uh, in the audience here. He did a vast job of doing that. And then we proceed to take oral evidence from witnesses, and uh, overall we took uh, oral evidence from 50 witnesses over 17 sessions. We also went to California to visit CERM, and we took evidence there from 32 witnesses in California. So evidence is entirely the basis of the report, and there was a lot of evidence produced by the witnesses. Um, so just to sort of give some background, of course, I don't really need to say this to you because you're more familiar with the field than I am, uh, but these are some examples of treatments that are available at the moment, uh, treatments that might be available in the next five to seven years, and treatments that uh, could appear in the longer term. So that was, these are only examples, but that was beginning to build for us a picture of the, of the field of regenerative medicine. We're also interested very much in understanding the importance of regenerative medicine. 
and uh, we recognize that particularly in relation to treatment of otherwise intractable uh, chronic diseases, regenerative medicine will have a key role to play. And in this country, out of the population of um, 62 to 63 million, at the moment there are 15 million people who are affected by chronic disease, heart disease, uh, diabetes, cancers, and so on. And that uh, number of people in the population is increasing substantially. So over the last five years, a uh, median increase for different chronic diseases of 14% in, in prevalence. Um, so that it's, that's why regenerative medicine is inevitably hugely important, because these diseases are not easily treatable by other means, other than uh, lifetime prescription of drugs. So as well as the quality of life considerations for those 15 million rapidly rising number of people, there are also important economic considerations, uh, lost days at work, and particularly in this country where the health system is pub publicly funded by the taxpayer, many studies uh, have uh, shown, health economists have shown, that the burden on the health service will be unsustainable within a few decades because of the burden of treating uh, an ageing population with an increasing prevalence of chronic disease. Now, the government has recognised the importance of regenerative medicine, and as the UK government tends to do uh, in recognising the importance of something, they publish a report, job done. Um, so, in the last two years, in fact, taking stock of regenerative medicine, life science strategy, strategy for regenerative medicine, uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the guy with the paychecks, uh, the checkbook, identified regenerative medicine as one of eight priority technologies for this country. So there's a lot of talk about it. The question is uh, whether the talk is translating into uh, useful and um, successful actions, because there is, as I say, a not insignificant tendency in this country and maybe in others for governments to feel uh, or to confuse process with outcome. So, so feel producing a report is, is an outcome in itself rather than a process. Um, so let me turn then to the emerging findings. And I should say the report is due to be published, uh, I hope, in about a month's time. So I can't give you the final recommendations because we're still refining those in the, in the select committee. But uh, these are the emerging findings which will underpin the recommendations that we make. So first of all, looking at the landscape, we, from the evidence that we heard from witnesses both from the UK and from overseas, there are some areas of strength, particular strength in the UK science base in regenerative medicine. In terms of um, ATMP trials, the UK in the European context seems to be doing quite well and has uh, a relatively large number of SMEs involved in regenerative medicine. Um, in terms of investment, is enough money being spent in this area by uh, charities and by the government? Well, as a career scientist, I know the answer to that question is always no. Uh, there can never be enough money spent. But this is the current, um, current spend, as far as best as we could assess it, £72 million pounds a year uh, from the research councils and others, £12 million over five years for the catapult, and Keith will be talking about that shortly. And then the, uh, the charities, the Association of Medical Research Charities, at the moment are spending about £30 million a year, but that is increasing. Uh, as I'm sure many of you know, for example, the British Heart Foundation has a major ongoing initiative, Mending Broken Hearts in Regenerative Medicine. Um, so that's the spend. Is it enough? Uh, as I say, the answer from any scientist will be no, it's not enough. Uh, one does note that in some other countries, and I'll come back to that, there are far bigger funds operating in a very focused way. And as you appreciate, the CIRM is one example, but there's a very large fund uh, funded through uh, a public bond uh, that is focused uh, very tightly on regenerative medicine. Um, we were very interested in uh, barriers to uh, translation and commercialization, and particularly the regulatory environment. And we heard mixed views about it, but I think the, the weight of evidence was that the regulatory environment in this country is more complex than it ought to be or it needs to be. So any uh, laboratory scientist wishing to uh, get into the clinic and eventually through to commercialization has to negotiate a landscape with 
up to nine European and UK regulators. And it's complex, and a lot of the witnesses complained about the complexity of this environment. You can get guidance from the MHRA, but it turns out it's relatively expensive compared with other European countries. But there is a new body, the uh, HRA, which uh, we hope uh, will, and we had some indications that it, that it will achieve this aim, will help to streamline the process. And others, I think, will say more about that later on. What about clinical trials? What are the barriers uh, to clinical trials and to scale up from small scale to large scale as will be needed when the treatments are available to the population at large? Um, well, the first point, which is an obvious point, is that having a national health service ought to make the UK a very favourable environment for clinical trials because we've got an integrated system with the potential to recruit uh, large numbers of uh, medics and of patients. But there are bureaucratic encumbrances, delays in uh, gaining approval for clinical trials, lack of adequate support, we heard from uh, scientists trying to engage with the NHS, and lack of, um, uh, lack of support in both the design and the scale of clinical trials. And again, we saw some glimmer, a flicker of light, in that the NIHR, again a relatively new body that's been in existence for a few years, is providing support to help academics to uh, engage with the NHS and set up clinical trials. Uh, what about the capacity to produce products on a large scale? And uh, we did hear in California um, a very succinct but impressive presentation, actually from Lonza, about the uh, need to scale and the need to think long term if one is going to build facilities that can produce um, RM uh, products at scale to treat very large numbers of patients, if that is the end game that we're heading towards. Um, so we're not convinced that in the UK there is uh, long-term thinking about scale-up, but no doubt others will express views on that later on, not just for this country, but for others. Um, a second part of the um, infrastructure is delivery of products that may have a very short shelf life from the production line to the patient. And there are, of course, in blood transfusion services in this country, national delivery mechanisms. But again, it may well turn out there needs to be further thinking about those uh, delivery mechanisms. What about commercialization, which I guess is where many of you are? Well, I think here we, um, we heard over and over again that at the moment, the business model for commercialization of regenerative medicine products is not well developed and is very different from the traditional uh, model for, for drugs, where uh, hopefully if you produce a drug, patients will carry on taking it uh, time after time. Uh, whereas if it's a, a regenerative medicine treatment that actually, uh, in a sense, solves the problem, then the patient may only need to take it once. And because of the high level of risk, of risk and uncertainty in the field at the moment, we were told that, and again, you will have plenty of experience of this, that private sector investors are often reluctant to engage until there is some uh, proof of concept. Um, now, in this country, and you're going to hear from Keith shortly, the, the saviour we heard over and over again is the catapult. As I said to Keith uh, earlier on, he's got a lot resting on his shoulders because whenever we encountered a problem, we were told, ah, but the catapult is going to sort it for us, including helping scientists to navigate the regulatory landscape, helping to solve the valley of death problem, how do you get from the laboratory bench through to proof of concept and clinical trials and get private sector investment. So, Keith, uh, you will explain how you're going to tackle all these things shortly. And, of course, the amount of money that the catapult has got, at least in the first instance, is relatively modest uh, in comparison with the size of the problems that uh, they are going to tackle. So there is an interesting question about the scale of funding versus the scale of challenges that they have faced. Um, we also took evidence, heard evidence, about the European Court of Justice ruling in the case um, 
concerning the um, intellectual property associated with, uh, with stem cells. And the, the view that was presented to us was that this European Court of Justice ruling, although seen in some reports in the press as the kiss of death for many uh, uh, chances to exploit this kind of research, actually is not because uh, often the, the know-how is what's really critical and the ECJ ruling doesn't affect know-how uh, of how to uh, generate um, uh, intellectual property through know-how. So that seemed to be an important element. Again, you will have views on that. Um, very important is uh, something that was said to us over and over again and relates to the high initial investment costs and the small scale, likely, of early applications is to have an appropriate model for reimbursement and pricing. And in this country, the, the pricing schedule is set on the basis of advice from NICE, the National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence. And um, it seemed to us that their time horizon for defining a treatment as cost-effective may be rather short in relation to the, uh, the investment that's required in RM treatments. So maybe you have to look at the benefits over a longer time period for treatments that are going to produce very long-term benefits as opposed to a drug treatment that might have a rather shorter-term benefit. Um, what about the international uh, dimensions of this? I focus very much on the UK because we're making recommendations to the UK government. Um, we, um, I think this is probably a no-brainer that the more uh, harmonised regulatory requirements are across countries, the easier it is for both scientists and uh, uh, companies to operate internationally. If you're dealing with very different regulatory requirements, then that's uh, annoying and may be a very important uh, barrier to uh, commercial development. Uh, we took some evidence on um, regenerative medicine tourism, uh, particularly concerned about whether the uh, advertising of treatments that bring false hope and may even bring risks because they're immature in their safety and efficacy assessment could bring the whole field into disrepute, which would be an extremely bad thing. Um, it's hard to regulate this, but w we think that certainly in this country there should be clear advice available, as there is, but it maybe needs to be beefed up even further to patients so that at least they know what they're getting, to, getting into. It is a case, I think, of caveat emptor rather than any attempt to regulate, um, uh, to regulate these uh, maybe less than uh, perfectly formed treatments out of existence. Um, we also want to look at what lessons the UK might learn from other countries, and I've already alluded to uh, the innovative financing model of CERM uh, and also a similar situation in France where a French citizen's innovation bond is providing very substantial funding to support uh, research and commercialization and translation in regenerative medicine. So... Uh, what happens now, we will publish our report in June, probably in about uh, three or four weeks' time. Uh, the next stage is that the government has to produce a response to the report. So we will make uh, maybe 20 to 30 recommendations based on those emerging findings. The government will have to respond, publish a response, and after that, uh, the government has to defend its response in the uh, in the, in the House of Lords, in the Chamber of the House of Lords, while members of the Select Committee and any other member of the Upper Chamber who wants to uh, participate in a debate will debate the, the response as well as our report. And hopefully, um, the government will accept at least a proportion of our recommendations. We have quite a good track record where we've uh, said things that the government ought to get on with, that they do get on with them. And we usually also, in a major topic like this, will follow it up. So it's quite likely that in, um, in sort of 15 to 18 months, we'll come back to this topic and say, well, what has the government actually done that they said they would do? And we'll get the relevant ministers back in front of us to explain, if they haven't done what they said they were going to do, why they haven't done it. 
So I hope that our report will be uh, a contribution. Our aim is to be helpful. Our aim is to be positive. We think it's incredibly important to develop this area of um, clinical and commercial uh, activity. And we hope that our report will be helpful, at least in this country, and maybe it'll have international repercussions in uh, progressing the agenda that you are all involved in. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much.